You've described this as an intelligence failure, but a failure is something that happens accidentally. None of the intelligence that was coming up talking about the storming of the Capitol, killing members of Congress, or killing my police officers was ever discussed at the conference calls that I was on, at least. That doesn't seem to make sense at all. It doesn't make sense. I'm looking at my men and women having their asses handed to them, and, and my first thought was, fuck it, I will take whatever yes. discipline there is. Once things got out of control, for 71 minutes, Pelosi refused to allow you to bring in the National Guard. Why don't we have answers? It, it doesn't seem like people really want to get to the bottom. Of it. And it gets worse from there. I had a conference call with the leaders of all the law enforcement. It was a call I coordinated. Not one person on that call talked about any concerns for the, the intelligence, the attack on the Capitol, that we were seeing that was out there. That's what's, that's what's scary. This sounds like a setup to me. I'm sorry, it does. New Jersey State Police beat DC National Guard to the Capitol. Wait, cops drove from New Jersey before the National Guard could get from the armory on Capitol Hill to the Capitol? Why isn't this story everywhere? I have no idea. If you wanted to understand what happened on January 6, 2021 at the U.S. Capitol, one of the first people you'd talk to, maybe the first, would be Stephen Sund. Sund was the chief of Capitol Police that day. He knew more about what happened than virtually anyone else in the United States. And yet congressional investigators weren't interested in talking to him. The media, not interested in talking to him. But we were. So earlier this year, we did a long sit-down interview with Stephen Sund about January 6th. That interview was set to air on April 24th of this year, and it never did. We don't own that tape, so we can't show it to you. So instead, we invited Stephen Sund back to explain what he saw and experienced that day. What he has to say is shocking. We recommend you watch. Mr. Sund, thank you very much for coming back. Thank you for having me back. It. So, um, I want to start with the days before January 6th, 2021. Um, it was commonly known there was going to be a demonstration or believed there was going to be a demonstration in front of the Capitol that day. You were the chief of Capitol Police. You're in charge of security at the Capitol. Um, so it would seem logical that you would have the most intelligence, the most up-to-date, most accurate intelligence about what was likely to happen that day because you're consulting with all kinds of other agencies, intel agencies, law enforcement agencies, lots of federal agencies. But it doesn't sound like you did have the most information yeah. about what was going to happen. You're absolutely correct. I mean, what we've learned that it was out there at the time versus what we had coming into it, night and day. And when you talk about the intelligence agency, I have my own intelligence agency up at um, Capitol Police, IICD, Interagency Intelligence uh, Coordination Division, Yes. Uh, that coordinates with the other intelligence agencies. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing the intelligence I was getting coming into it was indicating this was going to be just like the previous MAGA rallies, the November and December rallies that we had, where we had limited skirmishes. We had some skirmishes afterwards uh, down by uh, BLM Plaza with some of the uh, Antifa groups uh, and some of the BLM groups. But coming into it, absolutely zero with the intelligence that we know now existed, talking about attacking the Capitol, killing my police officers, attacking members of Congress and killing members of Congress. None of that was included in the intelligence coming up to. That you received. Correct. But others received that intelligence. Well, we now know FBI, DHS was swimming in that intelligence. We also know now that the military seemed to have some very concerning intelligence as well. It's hard to overstate how strange that is because you were in charge of the actual facility that was the focus of the, of the protest. Well, th think about it. I'm the chief of police at the United States Capitol, probably one of the most prominent and should be the most secure building in the United States in the world. You know, you'd like to think of that. But when you look at it, and, and don't take my word for it, look at, there's now four, at least four congressional reports talking about the intelligence failure, IG reports, GAO reports talking about various intelligence failures. Uh, but coming into it, you know, think about it. FBI, the Washington field office, didn't put out a single document, a single official document specific to January 6th. DHS didn't put out a single official document uh, specific to January 6th. That's very unusual. I've been through many other events in Washington, D.C. FBI would host a uh, joint conference call at the least, maybe a executive jo uh, JTTF, joint, Intelligent, um, joint Terrorism Task Force briefing, or an for all these big events, they, they, DHS and FBI would get together and put out something that was called a JIB, a Joint Intelligence Bulletin, zero for January 6th. So you've described this as an intelligence failure, but a failure is something that happens accidentally. And I don't see how this could be accidental. So walk us through the contact that you had with DHS and FBI in the days before January 6th. 
So my, my contacts with those two, with those agencies or the other, other law enforcement agencies would have always been through my IICD. Yes. They were the ones that were the conduit. We're a consumer of intelligence. We had turned to the intelligence community to get the latest intelligence. I know Metropolitan was hosting a conference call uh, every couple of Mondays, and I was on a couple of those conference calls. Nothing, none of the intelligence that was coming up talking about the storming of the Capitol, killing members of Congress, or killing my police officers was ever discussed in those, uh, the conference calls that I was on at least. And think of this. And so you never heard that? Never heard it. And, and But how could you not have, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I don't work in a federal bureaucracy, but that, that doesn't seem to make sense at all. It doesn't make sense. Think about this. On January 5th, the day before the attack at 1 p.m., I think it's 1 or noon, um, I had a conference call with the leaders of all the law enforcement, um, Conti from uh, Metropolitan Police Department, uh, Steve D'Antuano, the um, director of the Washington Field Office for the FBI. Nobody from DHS was on. I hadn't thought about that, but all the law enforcement that was down there. I had the military district of Washington, General Omar Jones, on the phone with me. I had the uh, head of the National Guard, uh, William Walker, General William Walker, on the call. It was a call I coordinated. Not one person on that call talked about any concerns for the, the intelligence, the attack on the Capitol, the threats to officers uh, that we were seeing that was out there. That's what's, that's what's scary. And, but, and, and but just to be clear, do we now know for a fact that the people on that call knew about those threats and didn't mention them to you? So this is what we know um, for a fact. And I'll tell you, um, I'm not the only chief that was in the dark. You, you look at Robert Conti, head of the largest police department in Washington, D.C. He also said the same thing. He wasn't getting the same notifications like the Norfolk memo that came out the day before. He didn't get it. So Steve D'Antuano, who's the Washington field office um, uh, FBI. FBI director. You look at the GAO report that came out February of this year. It talks about um, multiple emails. Is the GAO report, or the, maybe, no, it's a Senate report that just came out um, in July, just last month. It talks about multiple emails going to Steve D'Antuano on Sunday, Monday, uh, and some probably Tuesday, just the days before, talking about the violence that they're predicting coming up to the Capitol. And I have a video call with him on that Tuesday and nothing said about it. I mean, that's, he didn't mention that's that. not a word. Not a word. So, I, not to repeat myself, but that just does not make sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. Especially when you think about, think about this, the military, the United States military. Um, and this gets really convoluted once you get into the, the response on January 6th and how I was delayed getting resources. You have the United States military, um, Secretary of Defense or Acting Secretary of Defense Miller and, acting, and uh, General uh, Milley had both discussed locking down the city of Washington, D.C. because they were so worried about violence at the Capitol on January 6th. On Sunday and Monday, they had been discussing locking down the city, um, revoking permits on Capitol Hill because of the concern for violence. You know who issues the permits on Capitol Hills for demonstrations? I do. You know who wasn't told? Me. Instead, on January 4th, what does Miller do? He puts out a memo restricting the National Guard from carrying the we various weapons, any weapons, any civil disobedience equipment that would be utilized for the very... Um, um, demonstrations or violence that he sees coming. It just doesn't make any sense. Wait, wait. So the military says we're so concerned about potential imminent violence that we are considering shutting down the city. But at the very same time, they decide that the National Guard can't uh, adopt an aggressive posture. To right, protect right. The they're deploying because they're going to be deploying National Guard to assist Washington, D.C. with crowd control at metros and some of the traffic uh, control areas. But they put this out on January 4th, specific to January 5th and 6th. And this direction affected the National Guard in Virginia and Maryland. When I was calling begging for assistance on January 6th, they, they weren't allowed to respond at first. You look at um, uh, uh, Governor Hogan. He did a press conference saying he was begging to respond and he was den not being denied by the Pentagon, all because of the memo. So uh, why? You know, you, be, you, be, you begin to wonder why, and especially when you look at, at things like something that I, I recently came across, when you talk about the military. Um, General Milley, you know, we're now, uh, now finding out, and it's not, not from me, this is from Carol Lenning, you know, investigative reporter with the Washington Post, has found that he was using data miner on his own, coming across intelligence. T t tell us what data miner is. So data miner is an intelligence platform. It's not something your average citizen would have on their uh, computer. I, I guess it goes in and does... Um, uh, crawling across webs. I'm not really sure how it works, yes. but it's not your, it's a, it's an intelligence platform. He's picking up intelligence, talking about killing members of Congress and attacking the United States Capitol. And he's not telling me, he's telling select members of Congress. I mean, Carol Lenning writes about it in her book. Um, that's concerning as hell because as the chief of police, you know, he's, there's a duty to warn there and I should be told so I can take the necessary action. I don't know who else he was telling, but he sure wasn't telling me.
again, what could possibly be the explanation for that? You know, um, I'm not really sure. You know, people. But are, you've you've done this for over 30 years. You're very familiar. You, you you've been in law enforcement in D.C. specifically for over 30 years. So you know how the city runs. You know how the federal agencies respond to protests. This is not the first violent protest. Not at all. There have been many. I've I've done many national special security events, and this was handled differently. No, you know, the intelligence, no jib, no coordination, no uh, discussion in advance. Uh, it's almost like they wanted it to be watered down, the intelligence to be watered down for some reason. You know, I talked about a little bit in the book that maybe they were concerned for the um, Trump invoking the Insurrection Act and they're worried about that. But I've had people, you know, there's, there's other, uh, you know, uh, thoughts out there. Uh, but, you know, luckily we still have people investigating this because I still think there's puzzle pieces missing. Someone's going to find out what's really behind all this because it, it wasn't right the way the intelligence was handled and the way out we are, we are set up on the Hill. Big picture, just to restate, You've seen many things like this, and as you just said, this was very different. This was handled very differently. By whom? By, by the intelligence. I'd say one, by the intelligence agency, two, by the military. So the reason why I say the military, think of this. Um, by federal law, you know, Congress passed a law that, that pr requires me to go to the, two, to the Sergeant Arms Capitol Police Board in advance of an event and to request uh, federal resources such as the National Guard. So. Congress passed a law, it's 2 U.S. Uh, code 1970, look it up. Uh, just make sure you look it up before December 22 when they changed it. Um, so what was in effect on the 6th, that requires me to go and get approval for bringing in National Guard or fe federal assistance in advance. I have to go to the Capitol Police Board and get approval from congressional leadership in advance, like I did on January 3rd. I'm denied twice because of optics and because the intelligence didn't support it. So think about that. Let me ask you, who made that decision? Who denied you? Uh, I was denied by Paul Irving, House Sergeant Arms, uh, and also Mike Stinger, uh, Senate Sergeant Arms. And who do they, on work? January who do they work for? Uh, it would have been uh, working for Pelosi on the House side, that Pelosi was number one boss, and then uh, McConnell on the Senate side. Ah. So, so me, effectively, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi shut down your request. My requests were shut down, one, because of, because of optics, which is interesting. You're going to hear that term come up a couple more times, optics or the look of the National Guard on the Hill. Um, but yeah, and the Capitol Police Board, I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable that I'm, I'm the only chief of police in the United States that has a law preventing me, not just regulations, rules that say I gotta go and get approval to bring in the National Guard, a law. So that's crazy that Congress is gonna pass a law that controls what I can do to protect the Capitol and even in emergency. So think of this, even while we're under attack, I have to go to those same two people to request the National Guard to be brought in. I have 340 National Guard that have been activated. At least 150 to 180 of those are in the city, many of them within eyesight of the Capitol, okay? We get to come under attack at 1253. 1255, I called the Washington, D.C. Police Department. I talked to their assistant chief, Jeff Carroll. Thank God I had talked to him at 1059 in the morning and asked him if he could possibly put some additional resources on Constitution Avenue. And he had some CDU uh, platoons up there. Called him, said, hey, please send those in right away because we knew as soon as they came to their west front and they started attacking, it was gonna be bad. 1258, I make my first call to the Sergeant Arms asking, saying, hey, it's bad. We need assistance. I need a declaration of emergency. I need to bring in the military immediately and federal resources. I'm told by Paul Irving, quote, I'm going to run up the chain. I'll get back to you. I'm the the chain the is chain. Pelosi. The chain is, his chain would be up to Nancy Pelosi. He didn't have to do that, but he wouldn't give me authorization. The, the law says in emergency, he can grant me authorization, but he didn't. He said he'd run up the chain. My next call was over to Mike Stinger. He's the now with the chairman of the Capitol Police Board. Told them the same thing, we're getting our asses handed to us on the wet front, I need federal resources. He said, what did Paul tell you? He said, he's run up the chain, he goes, let's wait to hear what we hear from Paul. <clears throat> Sorry. So, for the next 71 minutes, I make 32 calls. I'm in the command center, I'm calling my partner agencies, and by law, you know, one of the first people to offer assistance was United States Secret Service. And by law, I shouldn't have requested their assistance. You know, I shouldn't be, until I had approval. But I'm looking at my men and women having their asses handed to them. And, and my first thought was, fuck it, I will take whatever yes. discipline there is. Send me whatever you got. And I'll, uh, that's the one tech Secret Service turned over. You know how they lost all their texts? Yes. It's the text between their um, Chief, Chief Sullivan and myself. Thank God for him. Um, but I don't, uh, so, so, we just, so yeah. you make this call immediately, immediately to the House Sergeant Arms who reports Mr. Irving, who reports to Nancy Pelosi. He Correct. says, I'll call Pelosi. He says, I'm running up the chain. Running up the chain, but that is the chain. Now, I hear you. I hear you. I got you. Yeah. Just, I want to tell you exactly what so, he said. So, um, what happens then? Does he get back to you? 
So for the next 71 minutes, I make the 32 calls to a number of agencies. 11 of those calls are follow-up calls. And look in the, the Senate combined report from, from 2001. They have a great infographic of the call after call after call after call. 11 times I call in the next 71 minutes going, where are we on the approval? Where are we on the approval? He goes, any minute now. Any minute. I'm going to get any minute. Finally, at 2.09, 71 minutes later, 2.09, I'm finally given approval. Think about that. 71 minutes later, I immediately call Mike Stinger, say we've got approval. I was so pissed off, I made sure that the watch commander, I'm in the command center, I yelled to John Wisham, the lieutenant, that's my watch commander, I said, John, mark the time as 2.10. I finally got approval for the National Guard. I was that mad. So what is the, I just want to pause on this for a minute. That's like, it's almost unbelievable. So this is an event that Pelosi herself has likened to Pearl Harbor and 9-11, you know, the worst thing that's ever happened on American soil. And she's in charge of allowing the National Guard to come in and respond, but she doesn't for 71 minutes. What is that? You know, um, I can't fathom why. I mean, they had to have known what was going on. I was telling them how bad it was. Well, it was on TV. It was on TV. <laughs> It was right outside of Mike Stinger's office. And they had a meeting in his office saying, hey, where's the National Guard? And they're like, oh, we're trying to make... The fighting is going on right outside his office. And I'm still getting delayed. This is an unbelievable story. Oh, it is. Now get a kick out of Wait, this. Has anyone ever explained this? It's, it's verbatim in my book. I have details. The whole, pa the whole chapter on um, January 6th is almost 100 pages long. But I don't understand. So, so we it just, I don't, they we're don't, only 10 minutes into this, and you've told me two things. One... The other federal agencies withheld critical information from you in charge of security at the Capitol before January 6th. And once it started and things got out of control, for 71 minutes, Pelosi refused to allow you to bring in the National Guard. So those are just, those are two of the biggest questions from January 6th. And my question is, why don't we have answers to why that happened? It doesn't seem like people really want to get to the bottom of it. It really, it really doesn't. It, uh, it, and it just gets worse. It gets worse from there. I'm, I'm sorry to step on your story. I just, yeah, I'm, it's shocking. Um, it is. It, it is shocking to think that, uh, you know, we should be a coordinated um, um, security apparatus. There's regulations, there's, there's procedures for defense support for civil authorities. I've taught it for the military. They don't realize they brought me in to actually ask me to actually teach us for uh, foreign governments coming to visit. Um, there's a process for when, when law enforcement needs help and we dial 911, it's through, it's through the military. And that failed. That failed miserably because of the law Congress passed and the denial I was receiving. Well, it sounds like it was, preve it was prevented. So Paul Irving, the guy who had, you're saying, the statutory authority to, to give that okay, to, um, has he ever explained why he didn't? Oh, his, you know, they had him and he testified at the um, Senate hearing in 2001. Um, 2021? And, I'm sorry, 2021. My apologies. Thanks no for problem. catching. Um, and um, a couple of times he, he uh, disagreed with my recollection. I can tell you my phone records. I turned them over immediately. I fought to testify. They didn't even want me to testify in the Senate hearing. I fought to testify. Why wouldn't they? Oh, there's, there's so yeah. much here. What, why, who didn't want you to testify? So when they You're first, the chief of Capitol Police on January 6th. I mean. uh, you and me are on lockstep with, with this. Um, and my story hasn't changed in two and a half years. So when they first put out the notice and they were talking about having the hearing, it was only for current employees that were still in place. No, law, no one that was no longer in place in their position in security. So think about that. Initially, when they put out the request to have the, and they put up the, they were talking about having the hearing, it would have excluded Paul Irving, would have excluded Mike Stinger, and it would have excluded me. Only three people, the three people at the top of the uh, security apparatus. So the sp Democrats, I think. Well, it was, it was joint. It was a, a combined joint. Sorry. I hear you. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Of course. The Uniparty. Um, intentionally excluded the, the three people who would know the answers to the key questions. Yeah, the original plan was to, to exclude them. Uh, I immediately called somebody I knew on the rules committee and said, please let me testify. I will be there in person. And I still remember, she said, you'll, you'll show up in person. I said, I promise you, I will be there in person. I want to testify. But, and I was the only one that showed up in person. It just seems like the denial of your request to have National Guardsmen who are within eyesight, you saw them, to have them help, that is, it, that's a pivotal moment on that day. Mm -hmm. And we know the name of the man who made that decision. And we still don't know why he made that decision. And that's just shocking to me. What, has he ever answered that question? No, he's, he, he's uh, never answered that question specifically that I'm aware of. 
Uh, and I do know when they were talking about the J6 uh, committee coming out, I think it was um, Representative Benny Thompson that had said, Speaker Pelosi is off limits. So they wouldn't get any of her records or phone records. What do you mean you know, she's off limits? I believe that was one of the things he said, that, that her coming into this was she was off limits to the uh, inquiries of the January Well, 16th. she was running the House that day. I hear you. I hear you. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, if we're truly trying to get to the bottom of this, trying to find out what happened. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, I mean, that's um, insane. You know, you would be getting everyone's records. I've been forthright. All my phone records have been turned over. And like I said, there's a, a description of all the numerous calls I made requesting approval. Think about it. In that, thir- in that 71 minutes, I called in 17 police agencies, 1,700 officers to help us get the capital back. And it also made those 11 calls trying to find out where. You are as precise as an airline pilot in, in your recollection of oh. things. I, I, you, so, yes. I, and I think everything you, you have said is, pr- is provable. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are not. The, the book's all based on fact. You can go through it. I reckon, um, reference all the facts I have, footnote. You get access to a lot of the intelligence. I mean, you know, it's it's fact. And my my story hasn't changed in two and a half years. So the, I'm just to circle back to this Paul Irving, who paid, played a pivotal role. I think whose name is unknown to most people, even people who follow what happened on January sixth. What happened to him? Um, no idea. He uh, he disappeared shortly shortly thereafter. Haven't haven't heard uh, much from him. Had a couple of conversations with Mike Stinger before he passed away, um, but nothing from nothing from Mr. Irving. Uh, so he was House Sergeant at Arms, and then when did he leave after January 6th? So it's, it, it's interesting. So he officially left uh, the 7th, but his signature is on a document making the, uh, my assistant chief of intelligence the chief of police on the 8th. It's kind of weird the way it worked. But, so I guess he was out the 7th or the 8th. Was he close to Pelosi? Oh, yes. Was he? Oh, yeah. He was a very loyal uh, he, it's interesting. He was able to go between Republican and Democrat pretty, pretty yes. well. He knew how to Not a play huge the political game. On some level. Um, but he was, he was extremely, extremely loyal. To Nancy Pelosi. And it's unclear what happened to him after he left. No idea. The Capitol. Yeah. Um, has he done, to your knowledge, we, we haven't found any, but inter- interviews about... Not that, not that I'm aware of, no. Was he called to testify before the... Before the January 6th committee, do you know? Um, I believe he was. I believe he, there may be, um, uh, I'm just drawing a blank right now, um, written testimony of his. I know he was one of the two that showed up in 2021 for the Senate hearing. He was on video, so was Mike Stinger. Uh, and they were asking him about you know, his uh, recollection of when, uh, when I called him. And he was like, ah, I don't recall that. Now, I had my first, my first timing wrong when I went and asked for the initial uh, uh, National Guard, I originally thought it was January 4th, which was Monday, it was January 3rd when he denied me the first time. Even though he apparently, or certainly federal agencies, had intel suggesting this was going to be a bigger than normal protest and could be violent. Absolutely. Now, you know, when you look back and you see some of the intel that was out there, and I reference a lot of it in the book, there's intel talking about going up and killing the palace guards. Those are, those are my officers. There are intel talking about you know, using chemicals at some of the entry points. There, there's intel indicating that they've done surveillance on some of the entry points um, at the Capitol. None of that's been included. They talk about burning down the Supreme Court. They talk about different attacks on different members of Congress. Um, and they, t- they talk about storming the building. Not a single word of that is included in any of the intelligence assessments. And a matter of fact, my intelligence unit is putting out documents on the 4th, 5th, and 6th indicating a low probability of civil disobedience. What? Yeah. So, I mean, if you were, and I'm not, but if you were conspiracy minded, you might think that certain agencies concluded there was likely to be chaos at the Capitol and that served their political purposes. And so they let it happen and they prevented you from stopping it. You know, when you tie that into a number of other things that happen, and uh, if you have them, and I'd love to take you through some of the military stuff really quick. And I, I hope you will at length. Um, is, and, and can I just ask, it, I think most people don't understand that the U.S. military would have a role in a domestic political protest. Why would the U.S. military, which we pay to fight wars abroad, be involved in a protest in the United States? So the way it would work is, like I said, through uh, a program, a lot of times the military will come out, they'll do support for civil authorities, whether it's COVID response. Uh, They did it during the avian flu, but they'll also do it during civil disobedience. We've used them for, I've activated and sworn in hundreds, if not thousands of National Guard troops for IMF World Bank, for inauguration. So we'll have them to help line the uh, parade route. 
uh, just to help us fortify the, uh, the perimeter. We'll have, sometimes they'll have what their, their QRF, quick response force, in reserve in case we need additional civil, disports, civil, dis uh, <coughs> civil disturbance support. Uh, so that's how they'll kind of support law enforcement. So 340 were activated uh, for crowd control, not crowd control, traffic control and management of crowds around like uh, metro stations. So they weren't backed up and stuff like that. Uh, not for specific civil disobedience. So we knew we had National Guard in there. And, and the defense support for civil authorities program is if we become overwhelmed, our backstop for law enforcement, and I've used up, I used up all my resources and I was overwhelmed, would have been the, the military specifically the National Guard. So 209, I get approval to uh, bring in the National Guard, probably 2, 210, 211. My first call, well, I've already called General Walker. Called General Walker at 151. I was like, I can't wait any freaking longer. I call him, I said, send me the National Guard as quick as you can. I'm gonna get approval any minute, because he asked, do so you have approval from the Capitol Police Board? And I said, I'll have approval any minute. Please just get them coming this way. So they're within eyesight. Shortly after 209, I talked to them. 234, I get a notification to get on the call with the United States Pentagon. I have to sell my request for the National Guard. I'm on the call with a Lieutenant General Piat, Piat, I'm trying to make sure I have his uh, name pronounced right, and a um, General Flynn is on the call. Uh, and it's mainly Piat that I'm, uh, that I'm speaking with. I, I get on the call, Mayor Bowser's on the call, uh, Chief Conti's on the call, um, and I said, I need the National Guard immediately. This is an urgent, urgent situation. I still remember saying urgent twice. This is urgent, urgent. And they gotta be looking at the same TVs I'm looking at. Um, I need the National Guard immediately. You know what his response is? Don't like the optics of the National Guard on Capitol Hill. Like, he goes, I would rather have your officers in the fight and we can backfill your officers somewhere else. I said, I don't have that option. All my officers are in the fight. He goes, I'm telling you, I don't like the option of the National Guard. You know, I don't like the optics of the National Guard on the Hill. I said, sir. We're having our asses handed to us. I, this is life or death. I need assistance immediately. And I still remember, he said, you know, um, my recommendation is not to support the request. And I still remember Robert Conti going, whoa, whoa, hold on. You're denying the chief of the Capitol Police? And um, he comes back and says, not that we're denying him. I just don't like the optics of the National Guard on Capitol Hill. And he goes, I'd rather, and he goes back to that again, I'd rather backfill your people. I said, sir, I don't have that option. This sounds like a setup. To me. I'm sorry. It does. It gets better. So I beg and beg, and he goes, well, I'm going to walk down the hall and, you know, we'll, we'll talk to the Secretary of Defense or whoever he's going he's to talk to. Um, right then I get notification. Oh, so I'm still, still on the call. We have the shooting of Ashley Babbitt. And I said, we have shots fired. I still remember yelling over the phone. We have shots fired on the USAI Capitol. Is that urgent enough for you now? Hang up the phone because now I got to start making my notifications. I got to call the uh, sergeant arms saying, "Hey, we got what looks like maybe a confirmed shooting." Do you know when the National Guard finally arrived? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. They're sworn in on post. Do you know those National Guard, the 150 to 180 that are within eyesight of the Capitol? You know what they do with them? They put them in vehicles, drive them around the Capitol back to the D.C. Armory. You know where the D.C. Armory is? Oh, it's far away. Yeah. Wa Washington uh, yes. White House is on one side, United States Capitol, D.C. Armory, almost equidistant yep, on the other RFK side. Stadium. Yeah, over yeah. by RFK Stadium. They drive them back then, and they send me in the evening troops. Not real. Can you freaking believe it? No, that's real. That's real. And you know what else they do? While I'm begging for assistance, the Pentagon's sending resources to generals' houses to protect their homes, but not me. So you begin to think it seems a little conspiratorial. I can see where somebody, I'm not a consp you know, conspiracy theorist, but I can see where people begin to go down that rabbit hole real quick. That rabbit hole? I mean, I don't know what the other conclusion is. Because... Look, under pressure, people make mistakes and make bad decisions. But you're describing a, a, a systematic denial of intelligence and then of support, mm -hmm. defense, through a whole bunch of different agencies, a whole bunch of different people, all reaching the same baffling conclusion that we're not going to protect the Capitol. Right. Multiple agencies with people with extensive experience. And you're getting this type of response. You know, and when you look at the level of intelligence, it's baffling that nobody put anything out ahead of time. Maybe it's not baffling. I mean, remember, this was the end of the Trump administration. You know, a month, almost two months, two months into a contested election. This is a politically charged moment with ramifications that we're now living through. But um, there's a lot at stake here. This is not just your average protest, correct? Correct. There is. Did you feel that? Did you feel a... 
a, a political vibe coming off these decisions at the time, or are you just so in your law enforcement? Oh no, I was, I was, I was so, I was looking at the cameras in, that were surrounding me with my officers, my the men and women of the Capitol Police and the other law enforcement agencies, you know, in in, in a fight for their life. All I wanted to do was get them resources. And that, I hadn't and even I, sat back and at that point started thinking about the political aspects of it. I sh- I should say just because it's it, this is our second conversation, and I feel like I know you at this point. Um, you're not political. I mean, you were a beat cop who rose. Mm-hmm. And became a chief of police, a very prominent one. And so, but you never, you know, you weren't like working in politics on the side like a lot of these people. No. Um, and you'll you'll find if you look through it, and I talk about it in the book, I am I try and be as apolitical as possible. I can tell because I think that is extremely important in the application of law. I'm a rule of law type of guy, but especially being in Washington D.C. and special ops, we did um, demonstrations all the time, First Amendment activity. You have to be apolitical. You got to go in. It doesn't matter. You know, you have a right to First Amendment freedom of speech. It doesn't matter if I agree with you or not, but I have to take an apolitical approach to provide you security. And I believe it's important. You don't need to know what the political leanings of a cop are that's stopping you on a traffic stop. You shouldn't. You should never know that. So I'll always be apolitical when it comes into uh, law enforcement because that's how it has to be. Amen. So um, by the time the National Guard actually show up at 6 p.m., Mm-hmm. Um, they're not needed, correct? The fight, the fight's over. So, the whole time they were concerned, they were concerned about the optics of the National Guard showing up. They show up. I have to. My, I have an official swear them in as, as special police officers. They take them. They line them up with their shields. All the protesters are off. They line them up with their shields and they take a couple of pictures for military magazines and stuff like that of them lined up with the Capitol in the background. The very optics they said they were so concerned about. They took pictures from military magazines? Think about it. You can look it up. You can look up on some of the, uh, go online, look like up. Like, we're the heroes of January yeah, 6th? Yeah, hey, we're the heroes of January Yeah. So, you know, and I appreciate my men. I come from a military uh, family. I appreciate the men and women in, in uh, military. And I will tell you, when they finally showed up, New Jersey State Police beat them to the Capitol before the D.C. National Guard arrived at the Capitol. I had... D.C. National Guards, men and women that were infuriated. They were so pissed off that they weren't allowed to respond. They were extremely upset. Wait, cops drove from New Jersey yes, before the National Guard could yes, get from I'd the put out, armory on Capitol Hill to the Capitol? I would put out a request, um, a mutual aid request that went all up and down the uh, National Capital region, went up to... Why isn't this story everywhere? I have no idea. I have no idea. General Walker even said, he, he called me up, he said, Steve, I felt so bad. I pulled up on the scene. He's the head of the D.C. National Guard. He said, I pulled up on the scene and the uh, New Jersey State Police beat us to the Capitol. He said he wasn't allowed to go. He repeatedly wanted to go and the Pentagon wasn't allowing him. And yet the Pentagon celebrated the guardsmen who showed up at 6 p.m. when everything was done as heroes. Meanwhile, they they sent other guardsmen to protect the homes of generals. Yeah, they sent other resources. I don't know if they're guard or, or Pentagon force protection or what, but... The kicker is this, the D- Department of Defense, and they interviewed me. I'll, I would have been interviewed by anybody because I, I, I'm telling the truth. They interviewed me. I provided them all my phone records. They were part of the, all, all the records. You know, they put out a report saying the actions of the United States military was appropriate considering the circumstances. Was appropriate? It's, it's online. Yeah, go look up the details. No one apologized. No one apologized. They said their no one actions, was fired. Their actions were appropriate. You know, they had an emergency response authority under DISCA to respond immediately, and they didn't. Um, do you think that the Pentagon was gathering intelligence before and during January 6th? Well, when you look at the fact that, you know, Millie and Miller, you know, specifically Millie was talking about locking down the city. He had to have some pretty damn concerning intelligence. That's a pretty big stretch for the government, for the military to talk about locking down the capital city and revoking First Amendment permit. In a in a democracy, that would be a big stretch. I mean, that's a, that's a big stretch. It's close to a coup, actually, yeah. at that and point. And then when you hear yeah. you know, about some of the stuff he was getting online and he was only talking to members of Congress, um, it, raises, it raises a lot of concerns. Um, does, the, does the Pentagon, does Defense Intelligence Agency um, have undercover intel operatives that you're aware of? I have, I have no idea. And I think it, it is important, since you bring up um, the, the intelligence, it's important for people to realize, again, as the United States Capitol Police, we're not part of the intelligence community, the right. technical IC. There's 18 agencies. Nine of those agencies are military agencies. So that gives you an idea of how heavily weighted half half are of the IC is military. Half of the IC is military. So, but I think the average person imagines that military intelligence is not allowed constitutionally to function on American soil. Yeah, you you think I don't know we're not ruled by a junta. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the specifics, but you think but, that but it would be... But in your career, have you seen evidence that the half of the IC, half of those 18 intel agencies, the military ones, are working in the United States? I've, I've never received in my times of doing special events, demonstrations, um, intel briefings, I've never received intel from the military. So it's always been, you know, the DHS, uh, FBI, it's always been, right. been those folks. Never, never anyone said, hey, we got this from military intelligence. So um, in, in the aftermath of January 6th, there's been a huge debate over to what extent, you know, there were um, federal agents or people who are working in some way for federal agencies in the crowd. And the initial uh, explanation was, well, none. And you're insane if you think that, you know, you're Alex Jones, you're crazy. Um, and then over the last couple of years, we've seen people confirm, people in authority confirm, actually, yeah, there were a lot uh, in the crowd that day. I mean, that's now a fact. Um, d did you know that going in? No. That they were, no. So uh, just for perspective, since you've been to a lot of these events, there's a huge dem a planned demonstration in Washington, D.C. Will there always be un assets, agents, people working for federal agencies in the crowd in civilian clothes? There, there always could be. And if for like, like inaugurations, there would usually be some combined teams uh, out there, uh, one for communications, but just, you know, for uh, situational awareness. So it wouldn't be surprising, you know, um, Fourth of July, different things like that where you have th threat pictures or concerning threat pictures. And what does that look like? Does that mean, um, you know, FBI agents dressed in dockers and tennis shoes trying to Well, look... it'd just be, yeah, just yeah. You know, plain clothes, you know, plain clothes to, to, plain clothes to blend in. Um, so they, that wouldn't be unusual. And it, it'd be, you know, just standard police work. That'd be good police work. Um, so coming into January 6th, and, and, and I talk about it in the book with the fact that shortly after January 6th, um, I'm driving through Loudoun County. I'm coming, I actually, I just uh, talked to somebody from the Hill and I get a call from overseas, and it's a it's press. I don't remember which what it was. It's somebody from uh, Great Britain, and they start asking me about feds in the crowd. And I was like, no, no, I would have been told. I said, no, we're getting word that there is uh, feds in the crowd. And I said, no, they, I would have been told. I've got lots of friends with the uh, with the bureau. They all have my cell phone number. They they would have told me. You know, thinking about that and Jill Sanborn's testimony in 2021, where she said they were taking overt action to keep certain people from coming to January 6th to to Washington D.C. That's that's big for, C, for FBI to start taking overt action. I mean, that's not covert, overt. That's a, big, that's a big deal. Fast forward to February of this year, 2023, in the GAO report that says on January, 4th, January 3rd, the FBI was tracking four domestic terrorists that were talking about coming to Washington, D.C., the Washington Field Office, their AOR, Area of Responsibility. By January 6th, they were tracking 18 or 19, it's in the GAO report, um, domestic terrorists. So think about that. They have 18 or 19 domestic terrorists coming to this event. So of course they're going to have resources on them. And they're not, you know, they're, you're not going to be just putting one agent. You're going to have multiples. So it, you know, it'd be multiple with that. And I don't know how many they actually had coming there. So that would be regular standard police work. So I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. But not to share that in the intelligence, that's concerning. So, I mean, it seems like common sense suggests anyway that you would have to tell the chief of Capitol Police that, hey, we've got our guys in the crowd. Like, j just because, I mean, you, you would want to know the difference, correct? You would absolutely want to know the difference. And, you know, deconfliction, you want to have things That's like right. that. A lot of the uh, folks will, will already know there's a lot of standard procedures for way you uh, uh, deconflict so you don't have blue on blue type of uh, situations. You'll have that. Um, you know, I, I will say this and just really quick. So, so that, that would ju just to, because you have perspective, that would be the conventional way to, the by the book way to do it. FBI would call you and say, hey, we've got these, we're worried about people in the crowd and we've got our guys there too, here's who they are. Yeah, so, you, so just to deconflict operations, they wouldn't necessarily call me, they might call my uh, deputy chief that's in charge of my intel and their people. Well, their sure, but they would people. call they, Capitol Police. You would yeah. coordinate, you coordinate with DC police, you would coordinate with Park police, you would coordinate with Secret Service, just so everyone kind of knew what was going on. And, and really quickly, I do want to say this, you know, um, you know, nowhere do I want to imply or uh, um, indicate that I feel that, um, agents instigated this or in any way like that. I'm never, never saying that. Uh, I haven't said that. And a lot of these uh, agencies came to my defense on January 6th, FBI, yes. Secret Service, stuff like that. So we just want to make sure that's clear. But there would have been some coordination. And when you look at it and you think with the intelligence coming in, if you think there's 19 uh, domestic terrorists coming to Washington, D.C., somehow that would have been included in some type of report. And when you look at the FBI's procedures, policies and procedures, and again, go online, uh, the... Um, 
Attorney General's Guidance for Domestic Operations of the FBI specifically says the FBI is to do an assessment, an assessment which includes intelligence assessments of events that are, I, I, they're identifying as being the target of possible threats and possible violence. I, I think that would have been the United States Capitol on January 6th. Look through that document. I outlined it in, in the book and see all the repeated failure after failure after failure of their own procedures to start identifying intelligence and making the proper notifications. So, it, but it does raise, a, and I, I don't have the answer to this question, and I hope I don't ever pretend that I do, but it, it does raise questions about the behavior of some of the people in the crowd who were instigating others to, to break the law um, and who weren't arrested. And, you know, given our facial recognition software capabilities, hard to believe they can't be found. And I would specifically cite a man called Ray Epps, who's now a hero on the left and funded by the Democratic Party, et cetera. But take the politics out of it. What is that? Here you have a guy on camera repeatedly saying, we're going to the Capitol. We need to go into the Capitol, into the Capitol. And he's not in jail when people who, who didn't go into the Capitol are in jail. I, I don't, what do you make of that? Um, again, that's, that's something I actually address in the book. It's funny. There's a lot in here. So my concern with that, and I look at it from a chief of police point of view, is you have somebody that's down, and I believe he's right near the old executive office building on the 5th, the day before January 6th, talking to a group of people, talking about we have to get into the building, we have to get in the building. And then the next day to see him at what's called the Pennsylvania Avenue gate. It's one of the two fence lines I had down at the, uh, the West Front. Um, and he, he's there, and he clearly sees the banner, the um, uh, metal crowd control barriers that are up with the sign saying restricted, you know. And so he knows that's a restricted area. And he's up there, and you see him lean in, and he whispers in somebody's ear. And he covers his mouth in such a way so you can't read his lips or anything. Whispers in somebody's ear, and that person moments later is, atta is attacking my officers. That's suspicious as hell to me. I, I raised a lot of concerns. What is that? You know, and what's interesting is I believe... Um, and and that's, that's verified. The person into whose ear he whispered... Yeah, I think if you watch officers. the video, you yeah. see that, and, yeah, that person immediately go and start, start pulling on the gate and start you know, fighting with the officers. And what's interesting is when... I believe he went on 60 Minutes. And on 60 Minutes, um, what he said was he went up to the officer and he told that officer, these officers are on our side. Don't hurt these officers. I believe that was pretty much in, 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 not verbatim. But don't hurt these officers, they're on our side. Don't, don't hurt these officers. Well, if that's the case, why would you cover your mouth and not yell it to everybody? Because it didn't seem like that protester was the only one that was possibly going to be hurting the officers. You had a whole bunch of people next to him. Why wouldn't you tell it to the whole group? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I know that Epps is being encouraged by partisan Democrats to sue people who raise these questions, but they're fair questions, and I'm going to raise them anyway. How, given that tape, could the January 6th committee defend Ray Epps, which they, which they did. Doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I'm having trouble answering that one. I, I don't know. Interesting. How many, um, peop how many federal agents, officer officers, assets, people connected with federal agencies do you think were in the crowd? Do we have any idea? Um, I, I, have, I really have no idea. More or fewer than normal, would you say? Well, if you have, again, going back to what I'm reading now in the GAO report with 19 domestic terrorists possibly coming in, um, I haven't, I've never seen anything like that in Washington, D.C., so I'd, you, know, you, you may have a larger-than-usual presence. Amazing. Um, who's Yogananda Pittman? Uh, Yogananda Pittman was my assistant chief for intelligence and um, secure, uh, um, yeah, security. Okay. So um, did she have the intelligence that you didn't have? I, I don't know. <laughs> what do you I, mean you don't know? I, I, I don't know. I, you, you don't know what you don't know. I well, don't know. Good point. I don't know what she, what she had and what she didn't have, but I do know that when you look at it, and we immediately knew, I mean, anybody immediately knew, one of the first things you start thinking about is, is this an intelligence failure? So think about it. We go through January 6th. Um, I was begging for the National Guard, refused before, refused during it. Um, we get the uh, Capitol under control. You know, I get them to where they can go back into session. 7.30, they elect to go in at 8, and then the House goes in at 9. But nonetheless, so think about this. The very next day, less than 24 hours after we got control of the, of the uh, Capitol, Nancy Pelosi goes on national TV, blames the leadership at the top of Capitol Police, calls for my resignation on national TV, and then lies about me. Okay? The very next day, the very next day, puts it, Yogananda Pittman as acting chief. But Yogananda Pittman... Uh, you just described her as the head of intelligence for Correct. Capitol Police. Correct. 
So if there was an intelligence failure, which again, doesn't seem like a failure, it seems very intentional to me, but if there was such a failure, she'd be responsible, correct? Or she'd be in the chain of responsibility anyway. Well, I mean, she was, she was the head of intelligence. So if there's intelligence <laughs> right. failure, you know, my thing is do a proper analysis. You know, you know, why do a knee-jerk reaction? I mean, putting her in charge, I mean, she ended up getting a, a vote of no confidence. So she didn't get the position from the, uh, from the police officers because many were upset with what happened. Uh, so she where, where did she wind up? Where is she now? Yeah. She's chief of police for the University of California, Berkeley. Interesting. So right across from Nancy Pelosi's district. That is correct, In the sir. Bay Area. That is correct. So you just kind of take the Bay Bridge over there, and that's yeah, that's where she is now. What does that position pay, do you know? I think it pays, uh, pays pretty well. There was, uh, you know... It pays extraordinarily well. Uh, it, I'm sure it pays. I'm sure it pays pretty good. It's, it, it's interesting. There was a hearing just recently uh, that was on... It's on TV. You can look at it. Where the chief of police, Tom Manger, was asked about her position. It turns out that she was given some type of a secret leave so she could leave, start her job on February 1st as the chief of police uh, and not retire from the Capitol Police for months later. Oh, so she'd get the benefits. Yeah, think about that. Yeah. It appears to be against departmental policy, you know, and nobody no, allegedly the, was told. What you're saying is that the head of intelligence for the Capitol Police, which demonstrably didn't have the intelligence it needed to protect the building, that person was first elevated to acting chief of Capitol Police and then given a very high paying job right across from Nancy Pelosi's district at the University of California, Berkeley. That is correct. And I will say this. So that looks like a reward to me. Well, I do know that the unit had significant intelligence. And I know many people within the unit were pushing that intelligence up to the, to the leadership of the unit. So I do, I do know that. Many of them became whistleblowers and many of them were punished and forced to resign. This looks like a scam. I mean, it just, just saying. It, it just gets more convoluted. You know, I, I do. I feel so bad for the men and women in the police department, what they went through. I feel so bad for the intelligence analysts and what they went through. Many of them, you know, it was, it was really, really bad. Uh, I feel bad for the officials that were either demoted, forced to resign over this, um, uh, forced to retire early. Um, there's a lot of people that need someone. I think an outside entity um, uh, needs to come in and do some investigation about what, what went on with We already had. We already, we've had many entities doing investigations. Yeah. I believe we impaneled this committee or commission, this, this body of members of Congress um, that went on for about a year and was on the news every single night. Did they address any of these questions? No, sir. How could you, ha how could you have a January 6th commission whose job it is to figure out what happened on January 6th not get to the bottom of like why the head of intelligence at Capitol Police didn't pass on the intelligence, why the chief of Capitol Police was kept in the dark and denied support from the U.S. military, why Yogananda Pittman wound up after failing on January 6th, getting a high paying job right across from Nancy Pelosi's district. Like who wouldn't ask these questions? Yeah, well, I know um, there's people on the Hill still trying to ask those questions and hopefully they can get, some, get answers. Uh, but it looks like they keep running into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Um, but it's hard to believe two and a half years later we're still at this point. I still think somebody along the line is going to find, you know, the smoking gun, the missing puzzle piece and put this together. But it does. When you look at it and there's still so much more to it, um, it just begins to raise more and more questions. It's just, it's interesting to, to talk to you because this, again, this is my assessment, but you seem like a very straight arrow guy. I try. Well, I could, it, it, it comes off you in waves. So, and I mean, that as a compliment, but like how long, how long did it take you to realize there's something very strange going on here? I knew there was something strange going on pretty, pretty soon. When I, when I was running into the issues with them not wanting me to testify, I was like, nah, this, is, this starts getting a little weird. And then when I started sitting down and, and talking to officers and getting information and finding out from some of, the, some of the intelligence that was out there and where it was and seeing some of the emails of the intelligence analysts pushing it up to their officials, uh, I knew something was, something was fishy. I mean, think about it. How, how, how can somebody not look at all this and think something's, something's odd? So, I mean, we have a media whose job it is um, to get to the bottom of questions like these, or at least to ask the questions of knowledgeable people with relevant experience. And you, you're at the top of that list. Uh, we interviewed you, never aired, um, at a previous job, but, um, how many other long interviews have you done with media outlets? Um, long ones, not, not very many. Um, not, uh, I actually can't think of any. I've done 60 minutes. That's probably about the longest. And how long uh, from your 60 minutes interview, 
how much of your account wound up on television, do you think? Estimate. Three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. So you're the chief of Capitol Police on January 6th. Common sense suggests you'd be the first person that any reporter trying to figure out what happened on January 6th would call. You'd think. Is your cell phone buzzing day and night from no. curious reporters trying to find the truth? No, no, it's, uh, it's calmed down. I mean, the first couple of days were something else, but uh, it's, really, it's really calmed down. And, you know, I'm not stupid when it comes to law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement for 30 years. I've done everything from ca capturing homicide suspects to doing, you know, barricade situations. Um, this didn't have to happen. This was screwed up from the get-go didn't have to happen, numerous opportunities to prevent it from happening, numerous opportunities from preventing my men and women from going through what they had to, and it never happened. There was never that opportunity to stop that train. Have, you know, there's always a concern that politics will infect law enforcement and the justice system more broadly. And, and, I, and I think you've thought about this. It's one of the reasons I think you said we need to be strictly apolitical in the way we administer law enforcement. It does seem like things have changed. And it does seem like politics yeah. affect the way we enforce the law. Does it feel that way to you? Um, yeah, and I, again, you know, one of the, that's one of the things that many things that, that are in here. I talk about the 2020 riots versus the, 20, the, the January 6th attack. The riots in front of the White House where famously St. John's Church was set on fire. Oh, White House, across the country. You know, I talk about the White House. Um, and I talk about an agency that was formed by Congress specifically for the protection of the United States president. Um, the Washington, D.C. Police Department. The White House is under attack, and they are prevented. They are prevented. I know it's not from Chief Newsham. It's from his, you know, he was the chief at the time. Uh, it would have been from uh, above him. They're from prevented from going on, cap on White House grounds and helping the United States Secret Service in defending the, the White House. So think about that. You know, who made that decision? I, I, again, all I know is, you know, Newsham's hands were tied. So Mayor Bowser, higher? I don't know. But, but think about but that. But somebody told when there, and there was real rioting. In fact, I, oh. I think well, that more officers were injured at that riot than were injured on January 6th, I think. Yep, yep. Again, uh, don't take my word, GAO report. More officers injured at the uh, protests up on the White House than on January 6th. And I'm told by park police, all charges were dropped, according to the, uh, the uh, fighting at Lafayette Park and at the, uh, at the White House. There were Secret Service agents bloodied and battered over there. There was a number of federal agencies that were hurt. Structures set on fire. They tried to light the Hay Adams Hotel on fire that was occupied. Think about that. Charges dropped. No, no such situation. I mean, when you look at the disparity of how justice is being applied, uh, again, that's, that's scary. That becomes really scary when uh, it becomes politicized like that. And that's what appears to have happened. I mean, it sounds like Trump is the key to all of this. If Trump hadn't been the president, things would have been very, responses would have been very different. Don't you think? I mean, if Barack Obama had been president, do you think that someone would have told MPD, the Washington D.C. Police Department, they couldn't protect the White House? Uh, again, I don't. I, I protect the White House. I don't. I see what you're saying there. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think not. <laughs> Just, look, I mean, it's a hypothetical. I, I shouldn't ask you to answer hypothetical questions, but it does seem it seems a little amazing. Um, la last question. Thank you for doing this again. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think this is important, and I hope that everyone who's interested in January 6th and its aftermath, which really has changed the country, will, will watch, this, uh, watch this interview. Um, but looking back after spending your entire life in law enforcement, how have your views changed after January 6th? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a big question. Um, I mean, my views of law enforcement, I still, I still think law enforcement is a very honorable uh, profession. I really, really do. Um, I think it's, it's being screwed up in a lot of cities. Um, I feel bad for a lot of people that are going into it. We need good cops. Um, but right now their hands are being tied. When you look at uh, what law enforcement's going on, I mean, I was just talking with somebody who, uh, one of their officers in Washington, D.C. arrested somebody, went to a scene of a robbery, recovered a weapon, recovered somebody else's wallet in possession with a, uh, with a suspect. Uh, made the arrest, papered a, a gun, went in the person's pocket and during the search, found a loaded handgun, went down to papers, no paper. No paper, armed, hand, armed robbery. Means all charges were dropped. Um, that's bad. That's bad when we're seeing the type of crime that we're seeing in some of these cities and 
they're not prosecuting some of these cases. Um, I feel sorry for the officers. It's you know, very dangerous for them. Um, you know, I still you know, love the profession, still love the officers uh, with the uh, Capitol Police, Washington, D.C. Police, still talk to them regularly. Um, they're going through a lot, and I just don't think they're getting the back and they need. No, they're not. And the effects on the rest of us are... are right, we're seeing it. Yeah. Stephen Sund, former chief of Capitol Police, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me on, sir. Young here, people say the news is full of lies. Kennedy's motorcade. 239 people. Don't know that. Jeffrey Epstein.